Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ICON Vancouver Coastal Health Indigenous Health Round. My name is Dr. Kendall Ho. I'm an emergency physician in Vancouver Coastal Health and also a, uh, a professor at UBC Faculty of Medicine, uh, lead a unit called Intercultural Online Health Network. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to join us. I know many of you are old friends, so welcome you back. And also, we have many new friends joining us, so really welcome you being here. Let me first um, say hello, and also I want to make sure we begin by doing a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that this session today is occurring on the shared, unceded, ancestral, and traditional homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Folks, we're very fortunate today to have uh, Andrea Alec, Dr. Ennis Lekka, and Anila Dina joining us today. Uh, and uh, you, this will be a fantastic program. I will be uh, uh, introducing them in more detail. Uh, and uh, so, but the first thing what I'd like to do is to uh, have a begin today's session with a pre-recorded opening prayer by Elder Amy George. And then it'll be followed by the live presentation by our guest speakers. Elder Amy George, uh, or Halila Halia, whose uh, given name is Amy George, is Slavertooth Nation matriarch and elder, the last remaining of the children of Chief Dan George. She's a residential school survivor. She's a medicine carrier, sun dancer, and practices seasonal ceremonies with her family and relatives. It's our pleasure to have her uh, giving our opening prayer. I'd like to humbly play the recorded opening remarks from elderly Amy. My name is Kalia Slayhoot. My government name is Amy George. Palliative care. I think palliative care is really important. Uh, it's like um, a scientific name on it. But there was there was ways that we took care of people on their way out to go home. Uh, really want to express my uh, gratitude uh, to Elder Amy George uh, for her opening prayer. I'd like to acknowledge that, in fact, uh, 
We are very grateful for uh, the foundational support of the BC Ministry of Health Patients at Partner Initiative. Uh, we've developed this relationship 10 years with them, especially in looking at advanced person and family centered care. The ministry continues to advance the shared journey of reconciliation, apply equity and anti racism approaches, and address system racism in the health system. Now, this is recognized in the Ministry of Health's mandate letter. And this is stated in there to continue working towards true and meaningful reconciliation by supporting opportunities for Indigenous peoples to be full partners in the inclusive and sustainable province we are building together. In this work, the Ministry of Health continues to address the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's Call to Action, UN DRIP, and in the In Plain Sight report. Uh, for more information, you can go to patientsaspartners.ca, where you can see resources for patient, person and family center care, chronic disease management, and caregiver support. I'd also like to acknowledge our partners with Vancouver Coastal Health, Indigenous Health. Vancouver Coastal Health plays a critical role in up, uploading, uh, upholding the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People Act, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, Call to Action, and in implementing 24 recommendation of the In Plain Sight report. But together, uh, we committed to celebrate Indigenous ways of knowing and being to acknowledging the strength and courage demonstrated while in enduring generations of atrocity and to embedding Indigenous cultural safety across healthcare system. We also like to acknowledge the support of the Vancouver Physician Staff Association as we work together to engage a physician community to build more collaborative, inclusive and caring community to support the best patient care, as well as the First Nations Health Authority as a full partner in the integral guidance and support of all these rounds. I really want to express my uh, gratitude uh, to Elder Amy George uh, for her opening prayer. I also want to thank those who already have uh, done their land acknowledgement in Q&A, and you'll continue to welcome to do so and appreciate uh, doing that. I'm now excited to invite our three speakers uh, to uh, go into their presentation. Uh, I'm very honored to have uh, Andrea Alec, uh, Dr. Enes Latka, and also Anila Dina as our guest speaker. Andrea Alec is the Health and Wellness Director at the Slaver Tooth Nation, Shesuwat Lelam, or Helping House. She is an advocate for all Indigenous communities for the right to access health and wellness services for present and future generations. Dr. Anis Latka is currently the palliative care physician at Lionsgate Hospital and a medical director at the Everyday Counts program, which is a palliative care program operating in the North Shore under Vancouver Coastal Health. Anita Dina, Anila Dina is a nurse by profession whose work in various clinical settings, including home community care, as well as acute and critical care. She's currently the primary care manager at the Slaywood Tooth Nation Helping House. And so without further ado, let me introduce them and uh, perhaps uh, Andrea, please kick us off with the presentation. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Dr. Kendall Ho. ACMC. Slochia Fanesqui Iyayasan Akhtama Tisleotith. Honored uh, guests, relatives, all of you joining from the different ancestral territorial lands that you're currently residing in, welcoming you to this wonderful space of learning and knowledge exchange. Uh, my ancestral name is Slochia, which was given to me by my grandmother from Stalo territory. Uh, I have the right to carry that name and hold that name. So just acknowledging our, our good ancestors that are also joining us here today and to all learners across Turtle Island, just really welcome you into this sacred space. Um, the title of our presentation is Weaving Indigenous Ways of Knowing and Being in Palliative Care. As Indigenous people, we have always cared for our own people and we continue to carry those values and those teachings each and every day. This uh, presentation is very personal for me. Um, when I look at the images, and as you'll see the images as we go through these slide decks, that the, these are actually photos of my family. 
The picture here is of my grandfather, the late Chief Dan George, Falia, which is uh, Amy George, who sang the prayer song for us, is the, as Dr. Kendall Ho said, the last uh, surviving child of Chief Dan and Amy George. The pictures in here as well, uh, historical pictures and current pictures are, are of my deceased parents. Um, it's really important um, that I, I bring that information forward because this really speaks to our Indigenous ways and, and teaching and, and sharing of one another. Um, just at looking at my own individual family, uh, my grandfather uh, lived in our home since I was a child. I've never known any other life without my grandfather in our home. My uh, mother and my father both cared for my grandfather, and we did as well as children. And carrying on those teachings and knowledge that's been passed down to me is why I chose to become um, a nurse, uh, you know, uh, furthering my education through those streams to better support and um, not just our community, not just my family, but all Indigenous communities in the hopes that we can better our relationships and have better understandings and how we can support one another through the Western model and through the traditional model. So with that, can you go to the next slide? We are to slay what people. We are people of the inlet. To slay what means people of the inlet. We are Coast Salish people. We are rich in traditions, culture, and language. In this picture, you'll see we have our, our community members and our people in one of our sacred canoes, also known as our ancient highway. We have 650 members. Only half currently live on the Broad Inlet on Indian Reserve number three. We are Hunkamanam language speaking. I just wanna take a moment to read out um, our vision because this still holds true to each and every day. Our vision for the future is to maintain our identity as to slay what people, respecting our past and being mindful of our future, sharing a collective vision for a healthy, holistic community in harmony with our surroundings, guided by our spiritual, emotional, mental, physical teachings, thriving in our cultural excellence. Next slide. Dr. Laka, you're on mute. Thank you, Andrea. So today our presentation will discuss how we collaborated to weave Indigenous ways of knowing and being into palliative care. We will be sharing knowledge on learnings from each other to build authentic relations to move forward for a better palliative care for all of us to feel safe, to feel heard, and for our healthcare system to serve all of us equitably. My own story began over 30 years ago. I'm a non-white settler who inherited a family practice on the North Shore with many First Nations. Coming from the UK, I had very little experience of the First Nations history. I learned much over the years from my Indigenous patients. And it is my Indigenous patients today who have inspired me to better understand the two-eyed seeing approach to meet the needs, not only of our Indigenous community, but for all palliative patients and families that we look after. Next slide. Next slide, please. We shared the vision for Indigenous people and their families to have equitable, high quality, culturally safe care. Our Vancouver Coastal team wanted to learn what was important to, to the Sailor Tooth members facing serious life limiting illness. We wanted to collaborate to build relations and to have palliative service available and utilized by Indigenous community. Slave Tooth Nation's population is aging, and because of ongoing e effects of colonialism, community members are often dealing with high rates of chronic diseases, cancer, and lower life expectancy. Our joint team's overall objective was to address stigma and the reluctance of the Indigenous community to access conventional health care. So, how do we address stigma? How do we understand the value of traditional and indig Indigenous ways of being and then? integrate that in the provision of palliative care? How do we incorporate 
Mekmo Elder Albert Marshall's two-eyed seeing of concept of learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, and from the other eye with the strengths of Western knowledge and ways of knowing, and then to use both eyes together for the benefit of all. So in discussing our joint projects, we will share learnings about decolonizing palliative care with a holistic approach to patient care. Not so much in hunkaminum translates to of one heart and mind. This represents our intention for this project. In order to address the barriers and challenges facing many Indigenous communities in accessing healthcare services, we need to be able to advocate strategically. This advocacy is only effective once we truly come to understand the real challenges around funding, staffing, and capacity building. Unfortunately, access to healthcare services on reserve continues to be underfunded. Oftentimes, there seems to be a misconception amongst provincial and regional health authorities that Indigenous communities are sufficiently funded federally and that all needed health services are provided on reserve. This is far from true. In fact, because these funding models are based on population size rather than community needs, many Indigenous communities continue to be underfunded thereby curbing their socioeconomic determinants of population health and perpetuating health inequities systemically. <clears throat> to add to this problem of insufficient funding, there is the challenge <clears throat> excuse me, of recruiting healthcare staff to work in Indigenous communities, which for much of BC are often located in remote areas. As such, one hired position often undertakes the roles of many, whilst juggling several competing priorities at a time. Indigenous communities are not at all unfamiliar with such disparity and injustice. The history of Indian hospitals, experimental surgeries, residential schools, and Indigenous birth alerts, to name a few of the colonial atrocities, has taught them to place no trust in the healthcare system. As such, the building of trust by way of authentic and leveled engagement through cultural sensitivity and respect is absolutely paramount to healthcare capacity building in Indigenous communities. In my work with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, I am witness to Indigenous people very much being experts in their own care and in what they need in their communities. It is not for us to come into these communities and patronizingly say, this is what you need, but rather for us to recognize that it is us as visitors that have much to learn from the Indigenous peoples. Along with this cultural humility, we need to be able to show commitment to the process, not come in ourselves with a timeline and agenda, extract data and information, and then just leave. The commitment has to be genuine, meaningful, and long-term. Documents such as the In Plain Sight report bear testimony to how our institutions continue to be plagued by systemic racism. It is imperative for each of us to take seriously our own personal and professional responsibility in undoing the wrong by knowing this history, recognizing the harms that Indigenous people continue to experience, and taking meaningful action to not only undo the harm, but do right by the Indigenous peoples. Thank you, Anila. The very last slide I put on here was call to action, responsibility and accountability. We've already identified a lot of the barriers and challenges that Indigenous communities face. And knowing, you know, knowing and putting our best foot forward, what can we do to best prepare ourselves before we even go to an Indigenous community? and therefore we have a call to action. We've already identified a lot of the information and grounding documents that we need to really verse ourselves in to better, um, better support our Indigenous communities. I find one of the things, you know, with all the information and education that we have out there today, I think one of the things that we really need to also talk about too and be aware of is Indigenous fatigue. And what do I mean by Indigenous fatigue? 
you know, we see a lot of information on the media. We have a lot of education. We had the 215, the discovery of the uh, children at the residential school at Tikkamloops. We have a lot of information out there. But even having said that, the information that we have out there with the In Plain Sight, how far are we along in taking action? What is our roles and responsibilities as healthcare providers? How are we going to come alongside Indigenous communities to better support them? And when we think about these things, you know, we, we have to ask ourselves, what is my role in truth and reconciliation? Am I doing my homework? Am I preparing myself? Am I, am I looking up information when I'm approaching a community or a family? How can I best support to really educate ourselves and not allow us to be complicit in um, Indigenous fatigue? Because to, uh, if we're not standing in solidarity, then we are complicit against the violence against Indigenous people in Canada. So with that, I just really want to continue to encourage these conversations and really grateful and thankful for those people that have joined us today and really showing interest in, in trying to come alongside our communities to better support ourselves, yourselves, and continue on this learning journey together. So thanking you for that. And um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Then this slide was really important. We had asked one of our community members, uh, we brought our, our working group um, to the Elders Health Advisory to talk about what are we really trying to achieve? How are we going to support our community members? How are we going to represent ourselves as Tsleil-Waututh Nation people? And with that, um, the artist came up with this absolutely beautiful design and um, as you can see here, we have four paddles and the colors of the paddles also represent the directions and the colors of the medicine wheel. The very first paddle we have here is the paddle of the individual. The most prominent of the four paddles because they are who we honor during this journey and during this process. The yellow paddle is the family is made of many, but we have chosen to put four members as it represents a spiritual number in, in, in the Indigenous culture. Sesuat Lelem Helping House is the red paddle, which is represented by the wolf within the mountains of Vancouver and the water of the inlet. And I also wanted to add the reason that the wolf is so important for Tsleil-Waututh Nation people is we're also known as children of Dakaya, children of the wolf. The last paddle is the black paddle, which is VCH, a summer scene of the sun, mountains, water, and a salmon within the water. The mountains and water represent the VCH logo, and the salmon is for the pad of care aspect as it represents the cycle of life. Each design passes features of its design to the next, joining all together on the shaft. Of each paddle are crescents, trigons, and a circle showing the hard work that each paddle puts into the water, making a ripple effect, the water as they paddle along together. And when we talk about paddling, and I had earlier mentioned um, the waterways for us were our ancient highways. As we paddle through the canoes and our, all of our journeys, our very final journey is a journey that only you can take by yourself. And we'll show later on in the slides that we also have the artist uh, develop a beautiful um, imagery of that final last journey and that journey that you take alone. Next slide, please. Thank you, Andrea. Much like the woven basket depicted here, this work is about weaving connections and the coming together of team members as a circle of care, as one heart and mind around the individual and family. Conversations are the very backbone of this weaving. Conversations about goals and wishes, about fears and worries, about what matters most. It is these conversations that inform the direction of care. It is these conversations that ensure continuity of care. It is these conversations that keep the individual and family at the center of our work. 
This circle of care approach also equips the care team to readily identify those who would benefit from a palliative approach to care. By drawing in the circle of care early on, time is afforded to the individual and family to be able to ask important questions, to ensure any pain or other symptoms are well managed, to ensure that important traditional Indigenous protocols and healing practices are incorporated into the care plan, to ensure the individual's and family's wishes are honoured, and to also get a sense of what may lie ahead. This anticipatory guidance, again provided through conversations over time, helps alleviate worry, ensures comfort and ease, while providing an opportunity for clarifying expectations and the offering of courage to embrace any uncertainty. Next slide, please. Thank you, Anila. In 2020, our palliative program received funding that enabled us to hire a project manager to coordinate our collaboration with the First Nations on the North Shore. Our team consists of palliative physicians, nurse practitioners, and nurse educators. This was a perfect opportunity to work towards a meaningful and sustainable relationship with the Slaver Tooth Healthcare team to learn and share practices that are beneficial in palliative care to all patients. The project began with several meetings between Slaver Tooth Health Team and Vancouver Coastal's palliative team. The palliative care services on the North Shore include a free day program called EDC or Everyday Counts. This program encompasses wellness, education, and grief support for patients facing serious illness, including their families who support them in this journey. Our dream was to have Indigenous patients and families utilize the EDC program. We started the project with sharing plans for having joint wellness events, such as basket weaving or Tai Chi to be held either at the Slaver Tooth Community Center or at the EDC Center for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous palliative patients and their families. Andrea shared with us many, many months later that the reluctance to engage fully was coming from a long history of disappointment and broken promises. In our meetings, we heard and felt the reluctance loud and clear. Regardless, we continued to be present meeting after meeting. We started to hear each other, we listened, we learned, and we did our background reading. We made and continue to make mistakes with our language and understanding, and we live through our discomfort, but we carry, carried on and our prejudices and biases are lessened. Showing commitment and perseverance led us to developing appropriate resources and pathways in palliative care. We're just beginners, but the care is beginning to feel right. In 2020, initial work and planning began on development of videos and featuring the traditional songs and of elders sharing their knowledge for this stage of the journey, in which they refer to as going home. For many, Trauma is associated with healthcare institutions and there can be lack of comfort. We learn from the nation that one aspect that provides comfort is traditional music and knowledge. It is important to note that the cost of de development of these resources was shared as partners between Vancouver Coastal, Lionsgate Hospital Foundation and Sabertooth Nation. This is a reciprocal relationship. In 2021, several initiatives undertaken were Vancouver Coastal Palliative Care Physicians supported the Slaver Tooth Nation's COVID vaccine clinic. Collection of the Slaver Tooth Elders surveys on palliative services helped us to guide our work. Vancouver Coastal's provincial provided a funded opportunity for palliative staff to pursue indigenous studies and cultural safety education, including Slaver Tooth health staff team on the weekly palliative care rounds for mutual patients was important for appropriate care and continuity. Sharing palliative care physicians call schedule with the Slaver Tooth healthcare team was an absolute winner. It lowered the barrier to accessing care. We were finally beginning to understand how we could share this back and forth between the teams to allow for appropriate and exceptional care for palliative patients in the Slaver Tooth community. 
Guided by the Slaver 2's team to support the elders struggling with uncontrolled symptoms at home, we facilitated, we facilitated an admission to hospital and a safe discharge home. He died at home with dignity. In response to the gaps identified to, with this journey, access and discharges and delivery of care, we developed a circle of care map to standardize flow and promote culturally safe support to Slaver 2's Vancouver Coastal palliative patients. Our learning from this experience was that bi-directional communication is key to improving patient experience in the hospital. Prior to our partnership, we hardly had any patients admitted directly to our service, whether it be in hospital or hospice. If palliative care was provided, it was often chaotic and inconsistent. Since our partnership, we have had more patients, conversations with the stable tooth health workers and palliative care providers for symptom management and more Indigenous patients are choosing hospice for end-of-life care. One quick story I'd like to share is that during the pandemic, after the passing away of an elder, her nephew was so touched by the care she received that he, his friends and family drummed outside the ER to honour all healthcare workers. Next slide. In 2022, our Vancouver Coastal team began, was welcomed to a luncheon with approximately 40 Slavertooth elders, Slavertooth health leadership, and elected chief and counselors to build relationship and discuss palliative care. The Vancouver Coastal team was formally presented and we were also able to have informal conversations with the elders. This was indeed a very memorable event for our team. We were invited to the Slaver Tooth Wellness Fairs, where we have collaborated to share and learn about Slaver Tooth community, building on relations. We continue to attend wellness fairs. Not only are they informative and inclusive, but here we build on relations and trust, which is fundamental to this work. Our team enjoyed these informal gatherings, inching us towards greater understanding of each other and towards reconciliation. Other engagements that have increased our comfort in our partnership include Vancouver Coastal Team also presented palliative care program on the North Shore to the primary care clinicians at Helping House, the Sesawet Alelum Home. Slaywood Tooth Nation's health staff also led a Lionsgate Hospital bed round on safe and respectful discharge. This year, 2023 has begun with a flying start. Over the last two years, we have been working on pamphlets on palliative care that speak to Slaver Tooth members. We are thrilled that the nation has developed palliative pamphlets that include nation's language, teachings, and art. A culmination of our joint efforts for this work over the last three years was receiving the 2023 BC Health Quality Award last week in the category Coping with Transitions from Life. We're super, super excited with the recognition, but we also realize that there is a lot of work to be done to achieve sustainable change. And this is only the beginning. We're now starting to work on integrating Slaver Tooth and Vancouver Coastal's partnership, offering wellness events at the EDC or the Everyday Counts Community Center, offering it to all our palliative patients and their families. As our trust builds, the Slaver Tooth Nation's Elders Advisory Council began playing a pivotal role in guiding our project's success and quality, ensuring that our initiatives align with the nation's philosophies and principles and teachings. We're immensely humbled to share that they have gifted a name that we placed on our joint palliative team. And the name is Angels with Open Arms. Thank you, Dr. Slide. I acknowledge that I carry with me over 15 years of work experience in healthcare institutions plagued by systemic racism. And as much as I know I have much to learn, I have also come to understand how much I need to be able to unlearn. I have learned that educating myself about the realities of our colonial past and the harms that were done and that continue to be perpetuated by our healthcare system, I have learned that this education is not enough. Alongside this, there is the integral role of self-awareness and the coming alongside 
with the lived experience of Indigenous peoples and empathically bearing witness. Pain as a symptom is complex as it is. Adding the intergenerational trauma and lived experiences of Indigenous peoples highlights this complexity all the more. Where, for example, the physical experience of pain readily brings forward the emotional distress that lives on in the memory of Indian residential school survivors. This pain is real. And though the physical pain of having their hand whipped is rooted in colonial history, any such physical pain now readily brings forward the memory of that experience and with it all the emotional angst. I am witness to this as the Tsleil-Waututh elder shows me her hand while her eyes appear distant and well up in memory of the painful past. In this work, that painful past is never far away and can be readily conjured up with the slightest nuance. Let us be mindful of that and tread carefully. Next slide, please. Thank you, Anila. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context to this slide. Um, I know I had said um, our one of our, our dance troops is also, we're called Children of Takaya, and this is why I thought it was so important here to have an image of a wolf. Um, because on our very last journey, um, it is the wolf that comes forward for us uh, and to take us home to the other side. So pain, um, pain is what the person says it is and honoring the person's experience. And I'm just gonna share a little bit of a case uh, story, which is a story of my own personal story, uh, and just really um, coming to terms with how we approach people and and being really mindful of what we say, you know, being um, from the health background and nursing for many years, uh, you know, I come with a different set of Western tools and how to gauge pain and what does pain mean, and I think you know. Uh, coming alongside somebody and, and sharing empathy and sympathy um, is, is so rehearsed that we we really get into that place of really not being present. And I'm just going to use myself as an example. Um, this is a, a picture of myself and my mother, and she passed away in 2021. And using my nursing experience, um, we brought her home. Um, during her final journey. And even during that time, you know, thinking, you know, I, I have the expertise. Uh, and my brother also is a care aide who is now a licensed practical nurse. Uh, we did receive some support services from the health authority. But during that time, um, while she was at home, uh, she was experiencing pain. And, uh, you know, coming alongside her and making statements of uh, her stating, you know, I'm in pain. And I'm like, yes, mom, I know. And then for your own mother to uh, respond back to you saying, you don't know, I think <laughs> for me was, was a real shock um, to hear my mother express that because Far too often we come along the bedside and make these statements like we know and that we can relate. And every person's pain is different and every person's pain is their pain. And we need to remember that and acknowledge that. One of the things that I thought was really important when we're talking about pain is we need to remember and understand intergenerational trauma, intergenerational pain. Um, and what do I mean by that? I'm, what I mean by that is I am a very first generation of my family not to be in residential school. My mother was in residential school, my father, all my aunts, uh, my grandparents. So thinking about that when you are institutionalized, whether it is in residential school or Kokalitsa, Kokalitsa is the hospital that they used to send 
the children from residential school that had TB in Chilliwack. Um, so understanding um, when you're in these institutions, uh, whether you're sick or whether you were being punished, there's that relationship between yourself and pain. And a lot of times our residential school survivors will not disclose pain. They would rather quietly suffer through the pain than to say that they're in pain. Somebody has to be in excruciating amount of pain before they will really say that they're in pain. And I thought that was really important to bring forward today. Oftentimes we find if the parent is uh, experiencing pain, the person, the individual, um, they will tell their family. And this is why family is so important and so key during this time to be able to support them and to make sure that they're going through these final stages and as pain-free as possible. Because like I said, when they relate pain to historical trauma, to intergenerational trauma, there's a real possibility that they will underreport pain and going forward and knowing that information to be able to be present and sit and make eye contact as opposed to standing above the bed, um, to be able to come alongside and to look them straight in the eyes and ask them from a place of, of being genuine and caring, how are you? Are you okay? On a scale of one to 10, what is your pain? And really hearing from them. It's so important to be able to understand that not everyone is going to be in that place to be able to say, hey, I'm in pain. And I thought it was really important to share my own story um, because like I said, coming from both, both ends, uh, you know, from the Western medicine and traditional practices, I myself was even guilty about even minimizing my mother's pain and just parroting, um, yes, I hear you, I hear you. So that for me was a real lesson in itself. And to be more mindful when we approach that bedside and what are our intentions. Next slide. So being trauma informed, um, understanding our colonial history and the intergenerational impact. Here I have a, a, an actual picture of the Kokolisa Indian Hospital in Chilliwack. Um, and as I had said, a lot of our residential school survivors, our elders, and even generations to this day, people that are the same age as myself had still attended residential school. I lived beside the residential school my entire life. Um, all my friends attended residential school. And in this slide here, you'll see there's actually a picture of my father here. My father is in uh, Kokolitsa Hospital here. And at this time, he's had, he's, uh, had TB. And you can still see in the picture that uh, the white frame of the hospital beds behind him. My dad was actually in Kokolitsa Hospital twice with TB and really understanding um, how can we support our elders, our survivors when it comes to pain. I will tell you, um, my father never disclosed pain. It was very, very rare that he ever came forward and said that he was in pain. Um, and unfortunately, um, my father actually um, had passed away, I think probably five years ago now. And that was a result of human error. Uh, he was admitted into the hospital uh, at the time and uh, they had misdiagnosed him. They thought he had pneumonia when he actually uh, needed uh, angioplasty. So they unfortunately prescribed him penicillin, which he was allergic to, which caused him to have a heart attack. He was then transported from there uh, to Royal Columbian um, to receive a pacemaker. And unfortunately, uh, through that care and through that time, um, he had suffered a setback and then resulted in another heart attack. Um, resulted in, in his passing. So looking at, um, you know, this particular instance, it really speaks to um, our survivors as 
why they don't want to present or why they do not want to say that I'm in pain. Um, because oftentimes we have, it has resulted, unfortunately, in um, one of two things uh, that they never reported and, and continued to be in pain, or they were viewed uh, the stigma as, as drug seeking. So I thought that this is really important to bring forward because we still have a lot of, like I said, residential school survivors that are still in our care today. Uh, so I wanted to just make sure to bring this forward and provide a little bit of my own personal history uh, to just bring this information forward in a way where it is really personal and it really all still affects all of us each and every day. So next slide. Thank you so much, Andrea. The concept of total pain is well known in palliative care. It encourages us to look at pain holistically, understanding that pain is multidimensional and that different aspects of a person's being, be they physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, interact in the experience of pain. Bringing this concept alongside the Indigenous medicine wheel helps provide not only a cultural framework for pain and symptom management, but also fosters a strength-based approach to care. Instead of focusing on the experience of pain per se, it offers an avenue for Indigenous ways of knowing and being to not only be incorporated into the care plan, but for these elements to be the very wellsprings of healing, connection, and meaning. Next slide, please. Culture is healing and culture is key for our people. Honoring the indigenous ways of knowing and being, intentionally creating space to embrace a two-eyed seeing model in practice. Culture and spirituality are significant and essential sources of medicine and healing for all aspects of total pain. In here, I have some words that are really key to our community gathering. In our First Nations community, gathering is the biggest, most important thing for all of us. We gather at births, we gather during ceremony, we gather at, during deaths. We always gather to support one another. Storytelling. To be able to create story, to share history, oral history, to ex the exchange of knowledge, but also the storytelling of healing. Whenever we have, uh, say for example, a home and someone is in palliative care, our community, our families uh, come together and they spend this time gathering, storytelling, uplifting one another and sharing those happy stories of, of what so-and-so has done during their lifetime. But it's also a way of showing our respect and also providing the individual who were there to honor the dignity that they deserve, surrounding them with love, laughter, truth, and food. Uh, one of the things that we always do as a collective and a community is whenever we have somebody in our community that is in this um, final stages of life, we have the matriarchs of our community that come forward and prepare food and it's three meals a day, snacks to not only provide uh, the food for the family, but also food for the guests. So the family doesn't have to worry about cooking and coming together for all the individuals that are paying their respects. Our culture is so healing. And in this picture, I have um, the cedar boughs. And in, in our culture, cedar is healing. Cedar is the tree of life. We also have a image of a longhouse and a longhouse is a place that we still gather to this day for cultural practices for winter dancing Sion dancing but also this is a place to gather um, and it was also once a place where we all lived in communal living spaces and this is where we did uh, take care of one another and live together I also have an image of a drum and, and the drum is so healing. The beating 
of the medicine and waking the drum and calling the drum alive to be able to come sing for our people, for not only our families, but for those individuals who that need that extra little bit of prayer and strength to support them on their journey. Next slide. Spiritual, spirituality is our way of life. Um, if you if you look at the um, pictures that I have here, they're very intentional. Our teachings start from birth. We have a picture of a young child here um, in regalia, and this is our regalia that we use that is that is very sacred and very precious to us. We start teaching our children very young, so they'll grow up knowing these teachings, so they can carry on the traditions. Like myself, I've learned from my mother. My mother has learned from her mother and her grandfather and the many generations before us. Our spirituality is what's really critical for all of us in terms of supporting family. Here I have um, the calling of the drums. The picture that I have here is a picture of myself and my brothers and my sisters drumming and singing for my mother's 80th birthday ceremony. But this is just another example of how we come together and sing our traditional songs to uplift one another, to carry them forward and give them the strength on the very last of their journey. Singing them to the other side is also something that we do, and it's such a beautiful ceremony. The reason that I have these here is also to just bring attention and awareness to whenever our community members choose not to be at home some of them will choose to be in the hospital or in hospice there are times we bring sacred items forward and we just want to bring this to your attention sometimes we will have um, you know individuals come forward that um, then place our sacred paint um, our red paint as you see pictured here in one of these images on one of our individuals that are on their final journey. And this is our protection paint. And we just ask that you be mindful of these things and to not wash them off. Lots of times we'll have medicine bags, um, some of their sacred items, uh, eagle feathers, and just really be present. Um, you know, when the family comes forward, because we ask you know, in this spiritual time in the very last journey, that these are the very last songs and the faces of the family that they're going to hear and that they're going to see. And just very, it's just a very beautiful experience. I, I had the experience when um, in the picture here is uh, one of my grandsons. Uh, the older grandson is not pictured here. We uh, sang him into this world. And it was quite cute because we we were drumming and singing uh, for my grandson. And as we we could hear the door keep opening. And uh, as I kept looking, I could see the feet of the nurses below. And I thought, oh, geez, here we go. They're, they're going to come tell us to be quiet and we're making too much noise. And then the door would close and the feet would leave and a new set would come in. And pretty soon there's like, you know, four sets of feet on the other side of the curtain. And I thought, oh, geez, you know, any minute now, they're going to come tell us to be quiet. And when we were done our ceremony, uh, we, we left and they, the nurses were very gracious and thanked us. And they said, you know, oftentimes we will hear uh, community members sing people to the other side, but it's very rare that we actually hear people sing children into the world. So it was a really beautiful um, affirmation for me to witness the acceptance of our culture. Uh, our spiritual teachings and our way of life in a hospital setting. So I was really grateful for that experience. And I just really wanted to bring that forward today and share that little story. So thank you. Next slide. Thanks, Andrea. We are truly, we are truly humbled by the graciousness of the Slave Tooth Health Leadership and the elders and the community to open their doors to guide our learning. We recognize that we must do our own homework and understand impact of intergenerational trauma and colonization. I believe it is our responsibility as healthcare providers to be informed and to provide respectful care. 
We respectfully acknowledge and raise our hands in gratitude to the children of Takaya and the respected Elder Halia. Tomorrow is the First Nations National Day. Let us look for opportunities to learn and celebrate Indigenous culture. Thank you. I will now hand it over to Dr. Kendall Ho to facilitate our talking circle. We have members of our team from both Vancouver Coastal and Slaver Tooth also in the audience to respond to your questions. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrea, um, Anila, and Dr. Latka. Really appreciate really a presentation coming from the heart and also fill our heart as much as it fills our mind and our knowledge. And really appreciate that so much. Really, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'd like to welcome the uh, team members uh, onto the screen uh, so that we can have some uh, dialogue. In the meantime, I do have two quick poll questions that I'd like to share with folks uh, and uh, see if you can fill this, uh, uh, give us some uh, feedback on that. The first question is, uh, uh, we'd like to just know, uh, we have, I know that we have um, uh, more than 250 people at 1.284 to 90, but just want to hear whether you're by yourself or you're with someone with you. Uh, so if you can start this one, uh, just let us know uh, how many people are with you uh, when you're seeing this. So we'll keep the poll on for a couple of seconds. In the meantime, I welcome uh, folks, if you have any questions, comments, you'd like to address the panel, uh, please uh, put that in the Q&A. Uh, and uh, I'd be very happy to ask a question on your behalf to share with our audience, uh, with our panel members. All right, thank you. Uh, many of you by yourselves. Uh, some of you are with one or two more persons. Welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for being here. Let me flash the second question up. And that is with the really a wonderful sharing uh, of our presenters. I'd like to hear from you whether you feel you've learned something that will help you provide or facilitate culturally safe care. So we'd really love to hear your thoughts on this particular question. Again, I want to acknowledge and thank our speakers. And uh, I'm also now seeing questions coming in, which is wonderful. Uh, so we'll be uh, doing some uh, discussion about those questions momentarily. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we'll end the poll at this particular point. And that also gives me a pleasure now to uh, introduce you to some of the additional members of this particular panel. What I'd like to do is I'll just name the person. Uh, of course, you already know Andrea, you already know Anila, and you already know Dr. Uh, uh, Latka, so I won't repeat the introduction to them. But when I introduce a new member, if you can put up your hand uh, so that the audience member get to know you, that'd be great. I have Dr. Jennifer Walker, who's palliative physician. I have Alison Corner, uh, who is a palliative care resource nurse. Vivian McTavish, a palliative care resource nurse, and also Jen Honey, also a palliative, care, palliative nurse practitioner uh, uh, in uh, one of the rooms together. I also have Omila Steed uh, and also Pat Rays. Uh, they are from a unit called Regional Palliative Approach to Care Education, or RPACE. Thank you so much for being here. We also have Leone Streeter, who's a community health manager of the Slaver Tooth Nations, and also Sibeli Tinso, a home care nurse from the Slaver Tooth Nations. I hope I haven't missed anybody. Have I missed anyone? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Let me start with the Q&A. Um, the first comment was made by Vanessa. And thank you very much, Vanessa, for this. Thank you for bringing up the pain topic being related to generational trauma experience and giving clear steps how to help them to have more constructive exchanges as we work together to regain health. So that concept of uh, pain is very important one. So thanks, Vanessa. I wonder if uh, our panelists, especially those who may not have uh, a chance to speak, uh, welcome your perception or perspective on pain, pain management, any comments that you may have. Let me just open up to the panelists, uh, see if you have any uh, uh, additional comments you'd like to make uh, around the pain issue. Sibili? Yeah, I think Anila yeah. um, 
um, talked about that quite eloquently, that it's not just the physical pain, it's that connection to past pain uh, that can pro be brought up very easily and that that awareness of that is very important. Just acknowledging that there's more than meets the eye. I think people also have an aversion to using the word pain. And I think when you try to use other words like discomfort or anything other than pain, pressure or, um, you know, using the word pain really has a stigma around it. And so if you can try to think of other things other than the word pain. Mm. Great advice. Thank you very much. Others? Yeah, also to add to that, um, that this with this pain, it's a, the existential pain. Um, just to give an example, an elder can share that it's the weather today that's getting me down. It's not the pain that I'm feeling in my stomach. It's actually the weather, the change in the weather. So just to be, you know, just to listen to the whole conversation about, you know, getting to that pain. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, and if I can add that, uh, uh, allowing, sorry, that the traditional medicines in terms of the healers being able to come into the hospital, the drumming and these other um, medicines uh, can, can I, I think also can, can be relieving some of that existential pain um, and being mindful that, that we need to include uh, these other individuals uh, in the care circle, in the in, in institutions in particular, in the hospital or hospice. Anila also touched on the time piece and trust, and I don't think that you can walk into a relationship um, and expect to get a lot of detail or those intimate details about somebody's life without building a relationship. And so we, you know, in palliative care, we talk a lot about uh, building a relationship of trust so that you can dig into that intimacy about somebody. And so if you really want to understand um, a total pain or, or total, any kind of distress, total breathlessness, um, you, you're you talking about something quite intimate. You need to be able to have a relationship of trust um, to understand the, the nuanced, the nuances of, of pain. And um, and that's the big picture thing. That's that's the investment you're making when you're building a relationship with a community, with a family, and then with the individual. Sometimes in the emergency room, it's really hard when, when time is really short, but to just be present and give that little bit of time to listen to the story, I think really helps and goes a long way in starting to build that relationship. So I think it's really important to, to spend that first few minutes and listen. I'd also like to emphasize that in being able to tell a story it has huge value and it allows the more telling of a story to facilitate healing to even greater depths. And the nature of suffering can be so deep. And it's just really at levels how we can really surface and acknowledge and share a knowing of what that story is, how we're listening to it and facilitating that clarity. And I think as we get to those layers of being able to allow for what we can make meaning heal, allows us to go even deeper. And when there's trauma, that is a, definitely a, um, it, it is of something of sensitivity to not go deep in the injury, but being able to allow what can surface at a time in a healthy manner. Mm. Uh, but that's really a powerful place. And with the pain and the suffering and to the degree and, and ultimately what I was hearing also was how the, the part of healing is a, is a huge factor. So. Wow, wonderful tips, uh, and wonderful approaches, not just tips, but really, uh, really sound ways, you know, start with respect, active listening, listen for words, in addition to pain, other words, and also allowing the story to be told and, and really respectfully listen to it, and then reflecting back to build a deeper relationship. And also coming back to what Andrea said about, you know, culture, about culture itself being healing, gathering together uh, and, and sharing that moment. Uh, really, really powerful words. Thank you very much. All right, uh, next uh, comment. Uh, thanks for the anonymous attendee. It's true, I'm a residential school survivor as well and have worked in the healthcare system for 43 years. I've seen a lot happen to our Indigenous people coming to the health field to get help. Maybe let me invite folks around the table. What 
you have seen yourselves, what you have experienced yourself. Andrew, I really appreciate you sharing your personal story. Again, welcome you sharing your stories, what you have seen, what may be positive, what might be challenges, what may be things that audience can learn from you in your interactions uh, uh, with these. Uh, welcome some, again, sharing and hearing your stories. I think for me, um, you know, when, when we look at the healthcare system is to always ensure uh, that individuals have their support system, that they have their family there, that they have their spokesperson there. Because uh, like I said, it's really critical um, that we have someone else voice their concerns there to be their advocate. Because a lot of times there's that hesitancy in how can we support them through that. We can support them to ensure that perhaps the Indigenous patient navigator team is on hand, um, any individuals that they can call to be present is really important uh, on so many different levels because it creates that safety. It creates a place where somebody else is here to bear witness to, this, to the care that I'm about to receive or not receive, right? Because we always have to be reminding ourselves that this is someone's truth. This is what happens and has happened to them. And how can we change that, that narrative? I'm, I'm also going to say and, and add to this, and, and I want to also remind people that th this isn't um, things that have happened, you know, um, so many years ago that it, it's not present. This is, these are things that are still happening today and that we always need to remind ourselves to, to also be a really good ally, to be able to say, hey, you know, I work in this healthcare system, what's not working? Um, you know, how can we do better? Um, you know, we, we've all have heard the story of how the In Plain Sight report came about. Um, instead of being a participant, um, then maybe you should be one of those individuals who are, are, are an advocate instead. Um, to be really mindful of what we say and things, even when we think we're not within earshot of someone, we're always listening, we can hear, um, and, you know, those have damaging impacts. And the reason I'm bringing this forward is I have community members um, to this day that still will say, I would rather, you know, I would rather die than go to the hospital because of the mistrust of the system. So I was making sure that we're surrounding our individuals with support services. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. Others, uh, any observations that you witnessed or things that you experienced or, uh, 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 Jennifer? Hi, yeah, and I think, I think uh, this was one of the ways that we were able to start improving the Slaywood Tooth Trust in, in our team. It was very early in the pandemic. It was the first year, kind of November, 2021. Um, and the Slaywood Tooth Elder was in, the, was in the hospital. And of course, there were so many restrictions on visitors, people couldn't get in. And uh, fortunately, because we had communication with the, with the nurses, they were um, contacting us and letting us know that family members were there and they needed to come in or um, a, a spiritual, someone who was gonna bring some spiritual support to the patient also needed to come in. So we were able to arrange all those things. and. Um, Again, it was hard for everyone during the pandemic, but I think particularly hard for, for Indigenous um, patients in the hospital because of that importance of family and and other support people being there for them. Just wanted to bring that up. Excellent, thank you very much. I really appreciate a huge number, a very good number of questions coming in, really appreciate that. So I'm gonna accelerate a little bit, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask the next comments. And if you have comments that would link up with this, very, very welcome uh, to do so. Uh, the next one is from Jessica. Uh, thanks for the comments. Uh, the question is, any advice for phrasing or how to ask someone about their specific beliefs around how they would like to be cared for, including physical considerations. Is there a good language to use to know if a specific cultural practice can or should be applied to others in the same culture? And what is an individual preference? She, uh, Jessica, thanks for listing some examples. For example, you're offering a walker, the person didn't want to use it, and also uh, some situations 
where um, the understanding uh, had to reach some understanding mutually. Uh, so I think that's the background of that particular question. Uh, welcome thoughts uh, from panelists uh, uh, about any advice for Jessica. This sounds like an Omala and Pat question because um, this really gets to goals of care and how to really open up that conversation, right? And do you want to take it, Omala? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the place that I, I like to always start from is, is just in general, what do I need to know about you to give the best care possible? So, um, I mean, even if a person that we're caring for is from a particular nation or a particular culture, they're still an individual. And so, you know, they may follow certain practices may be really important to them and um, maybe less important to the next patient you care for. So I think it's, if you come at it from a place of, I wanna offer you the best care possible, how can I do that? Um, I, I think that's a good place to start. Pat, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, just knowing that each person is an individual of their own and really um, coming at it from an angle of wanting to learn who the person is truly um, and, and really um, using exploratory questions that can really get us to understand, you know, what, what is most important to this person. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, I think... Um you know, approaching an individual, knowing that not all um, First Nations practice or culture is something that we need to be aware of. We do have residential school survivors um, that have lost um, that culture, uh, those spiritual practices. So just being mindful of that. And I think one of the key things is always just plain language mm -hmm. to really come alongside someone and ask them, I really would like to be respectful um, of, you know, any culture or spiritual practices that you may have. I want to make sure that I'm carrying myself respectfully. And I would like to ask you some questions on how you'd like to be cared for. Mm -hmm. I, I think when we come from a place of respect, um, acknowledging that culture and that spirituality and that opens up a different level of conversation when we're sitting with someone because you're acknowledging who they are as an Indigenous person. And it's opening up that conversation doorway as opposed to just very general standard statements. Excellent. Thank you. I also noticed, Andrea, you, you intentionally use come alongside. I really love that idea that you are accompanying, partnering with them. So, so really appreciate that, that thinking there. Um, uh, Farron, thanks for your question. Can you explain more about the different roles on your team? And can you foresee a model like this being used elsewhere in the province? I, I, I would like to answer a little bit of that. I definitely see that this is something that can work in other First Nations community. And this is what our hope was when we, when we entered this journey together to really um, work with the team that we have here to bring them to a place of, of what your approach should be and how do you approach a community. And this is why I felt it was really important to put in the barriers and challenges, knowing that Indigenous communities are underfunded. Um, if you're going to come forward and work with an Indigenous community, what are you bringing forward? What are you offering that Indigenous community? Because uh, a lot of times health directors, health administrators have multiple, multiple positions and they have to have competing priorities and have to determine what's important for me today. Do I have the time to commit to this process? Is it going to go somewhere? Is there a commitment on the, on the other, uh, you know, this group's part? Or is this another one of the same interactions? So looking at and understanding these barriers is really going to help you engage other communities, knowing that information and saying, this is what we can offer. I prefer to hear how we can better support you. However, this is what we're coming forward with and give the First Nations the opportunity to tell you um, what is gonna work for them. Um, what is the preferred approach? How do we go forward and, and developing a relationship after this um, to be long-term and to be sustainable? Because one of the things Indigenous communities often see is there is no continuity of care. There is um, 
you know, no succession planning and to implement something so successful and beautiful. And we have continuous transitions of people moving in and out of these positions. You've already built that trust and there needs to be that um, continuity of trust. I wanted to echo that actually, Andrea, you've almost spoken. <laughs> what I was going to say is that the connection between um, what we bring is almost secondary to coming and saying, what can we bring that would help is the most important question. And um, on an individual professional level, from nursing point of view, Leone at, from the nation, and uh, we got together to kind of discuss what you have that's really helpful for us and vice versa so that we share um, and we continue that dialogue as we have people who need the care. We talk about, you know, individualizing it to them and what is best to come from each place. So it's partnership that's coming alongside, not just with the person, but with the, the two um, care provisions. Excellent. Thank you. I know we have only 12 minutes and a uh, uh, good number of questions. We'll try to answer as many as possible, uh, but even if we may not get to answer it, your perspective is going to be so important. So I ask you, invite you to continue to submit questions uh, and comments. Uh, another anonymous attendee, uh, any direction in how we can support Indigenous peoples and families if the palliative person has chosen medical assistance in dying? Your thoughts? We have actually had um, both of these cases in our community, individuals who choose to be at home, individuals who choose to pass away, and also individuals who uh, have assisted. It's exactly, um, you know, no different of a conversation. It's starting early with those early conversations. Um, and through our process, we are developing a legacy book and that exactly extracts the information that we need to better support our teams um, to support the individuals and the families on what that individual has chosen personally for themselves. Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ennis? Oh, no. yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's building the legacy. It's like for any palliative patient, really, at the end of their life's journey. Add to that the traditional, the importance of the traditional values and the Indigenous values that they bring. And when we look at that person as a whole person in palliative care, physical, psychosocial, emotional, and all and spiritual are all part of that person, that human being that, we're, that we are uh, treating or looking after. I think that that's when we the voices of all this other uh, allied and, and health that helps us to then treat that individually and in their journey to listen to them, to let them be the drivers of their bus to, to direct us for their care. And I think that these are the things that we want to hear and want to be su supporting and supportive of and know how important it is. It's not just the physical symptom. It's not shortness of breath. It's just all of that person. So I think that that legacy piece and, and working together early on starting that journey really allows us to deliver that care impeccably. Excellent, thank you. Anila, do you wanna say something? Yeah, thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Dr. Laka, as well. Um, just building on those thoughts, when it comes to MAID, um, again, it really comes down to that conversation that you're having with the individual um, and having that curiosity, having that leveled engagement to understand, you know, what their wishes are. I think the earlier you have these conversations, like Andrea said, the more you'll come to understand the full picture around their goals, their wishes. And it's really important to like, really understand like, why are they choosing this, right? Are they, are their symptoms so poorly managed that, you know, they're asking for made out of desperation, right? If their symptoms are better controlled, will they likely not ask for made? So I think it is trying to maintain that curiosity that level of engagement and really trying to have those conversations earlier on so that you're not meeting them in a time of crises. Mm. Thank you. Very important. Thank you. Uh, Joan has a comment I'd like to share. Uh, thank you so much for this session and sharing. I deeply appreciate the investment into teaching, learning, and communication that you have shared over the years to create the caring relationship that exists now. Um, so she has to go, but she just want to let you know that uh, she thank you very much for your sharing. 
uh, Heather has uh, uh, working in uh, Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. Uh, she seemed to find that there's some differences uh, in uh, when working in Fraser Health when advocating for indigenous patients and wondering if there's a, you know, uh, initiative or investments uh, or not investments is the wrong word, but but are there different numbers of initiatives? Uh, are you aware of any difference, Vancouver Coastal and Fraser, in terms of the number of initiatives, et cetera? That's no worries. Uh, Heather, thanks for, yep, go ahead. No, I no, we're not aware of that. We started with our funding in a very, very small project in just wanting to start the journey. And so that's how we came about to sort of forming this relationship in 2020. Really and truly just sort of saying this, this is the funding we've got. A project manager will really help us to build a sustainable relationship that we can then continue to. So that's the dance that we began with and, and have and we were so fortunate. That we met Andrea and her team and, and, and they engaged and then we were able to move forward so much more further than, than you know, initially what we had even hoped for. But, you know, what Aniston really stressed during uh, her piece is that we, we actually lost our funding for our project manager at one point and we had to fight very heavily to get it back because, you know, the business model of running a health authority does not compete with the qualitative work of developing a long term relationship. And so when we, when we, you know, you're not meeting a deliverable that's that's part of a business model, then you lose your funding. And but the thing yeah. is, the deliverable is a qualitative relationship that you can't actually write down on a piece of paper. So we had to, you know, we have to to go back to the, and you know stick it and say, well, listen, this is what we're doing is we're not delivering a thing that you can write on a piece of paper. We're committing, and what we're committing to doing is is undoing what we've screwed up for a hundred and seven, whatever, a hundred of years. So we actually, we're doing it the right way this time and we're gonna, we're in it till we do it right. So we're not gonna be able to do it that way. And we had to fight for our project manager for however long it takes. And that's the difference, right? Like that's the decolonization is, and that's maybe what they're not doing at Fraser. I don't know what they're doing at Fraser, but if we're actually going to do this, we have to get uncomfortable and sit in our stink and and figure out how to make it work that doesn't look like it's been done before. And it takes and time is not there's no timing. There's no looking at the there's time. No, it's actually whatever time it takes. There's no business model deliverables that look like whatever they want them to look like, because we have to keep going back and forth and back and forth. And it's a dance. And we take it to the elders who say, I'm not sure when it's going to be back. And it took what, a year? And we're looking, we're waiting for, you know, some feedback, and then there's a pandemic, and then we're waiting for some artwork, and it's not, the, you know what, and so what? Like, this is what the point is. The point is it's commitment, and we said we're going to make it, and so we have to sit there, and we have to wait. And and it actually took, it's good, because it actually gives us time to, like Annie said, it takes us, gives us time to do our homework, because you guess what you don't do? You don't go ask the nation, you do your own homework because they're tired of being asked. Mm. They're tired of being asked to do our homework. It's our work, not theirs, right? So that's the whole point of this. This is the decolonization. Oh, excellent. Thanks, Jen, well said. That's my soapbox. No, uh, thanks for unpacking that, so important. Can uh, I say one more thing? I Sorry, uh, actually, I, one more and then we'll squeeze in one more yeah, question. Yeah, I, yeah, go for I it. I just wanted to stress how, uh, you know the the relationship building and and gaining slowly gaining trust from the nation is, is the fundamental work here and and you just can't put a time frame on it and so for any um, administrators hiring up thinking about I think it's important to realize that it, it doesn't just fit in a certain timeline. Thank you. Important point. Uh, this last question, uh, uh, thank uh, from Jody. Thank you for your one presentation and congrats on this excellent work. Have you had an opportunity to write up a report regarding how you did your project so that other health authorities may adopt this approach? Also, is there anything that you did in your project that you would not repeat, do differently next time? And I'll tack on one, you just presented in Quality Forum. And I wonder if that kind of presentation is also available for sharing. Welcome thoughts. Sarah. Yes, uh, the presentation at Quality Forum uh, will be, it's not up yet, but it will be on the Health Quality BC website fairly soon. And what was the basic article? What did it, it did share? 
Yeah, so at the BC Poly Forum, we're really fortunate, um, Dr. Laka, Andrea, and myself, to share a little bit on the Indigenous Palliative Care Projects. Uh, it was a rapid fire presentation, so a 10 minute, very condensed. Um, and so we were really fortunate to win the Health Quality BC Award. And so we did write that up at that point. Um, and so we're really fortunate to share our learnings at that opportunity. Excellent. Wonderful. It, uh, time flies. Uh, uh, so it's just amazing. And, and thank you so much, not only the really heartfelt presentation, but also shed huge light during this talking circle. So we really want to thank you all uh, for one, spending the time and two, helping us to learn the homework and, uh, uh, and, and really helping us to understand how to approach this. So really want to thank you all. Uh, for the audience members, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there's a link in the um, in the chat. Uh, we really welcome your feedback. Uh, this session and also previous sessions were really direct input from the audience, and we'll continue to plan sessions ahead. And hope that this session has been helpful to you, as it's hugely helpful to myself. There was an early comment also saying that are there resources for this round? Uh, of course, this round is recorded. So if you have colleagues who you feel would be helpful to watch this session, it's on the recording. And secondly, uh, we have actually, thanks to Vancouver Physician Staff Association's funding, we're able to engage Indigenous artists to do infographics of all the presentations, including this one. So that will be a quick summary of the input. Of course, we welcome people re, uh, to see the whole session, uh, but also some quick tips and quick ways of learning about the particular session. And so with that, I'm gonna close here, again, on behalf of uh, Ministry of Health, on behalf of uh, Vancouver Coastal Health, Indigenous Health, on behalf of Vancouver Physician Staff Association, and on behalf of First Nations Health Authority and together with Intercultural Online Health Network, I wanna thank all the speakers, all the panelists, and also I wanna thank all the participants so we can share this really intimate yet huge learning moments uh, together. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a safe journey to wherever you are uh, ongoing and may the lessons stay with us uh, at all times. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Mm -hmm.